This is a story of ambition and the pursuit of creativity going head to head with legacy media. A story about how a man, in his relentless pursuit to show the world a new style of animation, set a number of precedents that have resulted in the exploitation of young artists and now threatens to destroy the very medium he risked everything to create. Our story begins here, in Japan. But it was a Japan quite different from the one we know of today. When he was just 17, Tezuka witnessed Japan go from imperial superpower to a nation in complete economic and cultural ruin, now occupied by a foreign military power. However, during the Cold War, the United States really started to fear that a rather poor Japan that had been devastated by the war would start a movement toward communism. Oh, and that was a big no-no. So, the US wrote Japan a new constitution, helped rebuild their economic infrastructure, and started importing everything made in Japan to help stimulate their economy. I'm talking cars, cameras, calculators, computers, printers, TVs. Oh, and fortunately for Tezuka, TV shows. By this point, it's now the 1960s, and Tezuka had already cemented himself as one of the greatest manga artists of all time. One of his creations, Astro Boy, had already become a nationwide phenomenon. But Tezuka, after seeing what Disney was able to accomplish in the West, wanted to prove that it wasn't just the Americans who could produce animations. The Japanese could do it too. There was just one small problem. No one was willing to invest in Tezuka's vision. What Tezuka is talking about here is that the simple reason he was unable to find a significant number of investors for his show is because Japanese animation at the time had yet to find a way to show investors that it could turn a profit. So Tezuka and his production company had to set the precedent for what a profitable animated TV show could look like. And it's these precedents that are at the core of many of the problems we see in the anime industry today. The first of these precedents being keeping costs low. When Tezuka was first forming his core animation team, he incentivized some of his former colleagues from Toei Animation to join his production by paying them a salary more than double what Toei was paying them at the time. But Tezuka quickly realized that if he had to pay every animator double the industry standard, he was very quickly going to run out of money. This is where the practice of subcontracting in animation came from. If a person is a contractor and not an employee, the employer does not need to provide health benefits, paid time off, or other benefits to them. Additionally, contractors aren't subject to minimum wage standards set by labor laws and are instead paid based on what is defined by the contract. In the case of animators, they are paid per frame or per drawing. So Tezuka set the pay for these contracted animators at about 200 yen, approximately 2 US dollars per drawing. This is where the low base pay for entry-level animators came from. Look at this graph. It shows how entry-level animators are paid compared to the national average. It's a career that barely puts them above Japan's poverty line. And since studios won't hire animators without experience, entry-level animators have no other choice but to take on work as contractors, because there's no other way for them to gain the experience they need in order to be hired as a permanent employee by a studio. It's a good old catch-22. If, if you don't mind me asking, when you did your internship initially, mm. how much were you getting paid for that? And you, were you living off well, just that? Uh, at the first internship, I wasn't paid. And if you want to understand why the cost of animators was still a massive issue for Tezuka, you first need to have an understanding of how an anime is produced. Anime is traditionally produced at 24 frames per second. So what this means is, an animator would need to draw 24 unique drawings for each second of animation. This is called animating on ones, because one drawing only holds for one frame. And at 24 frames per second, a single animated episode of Astro Boy 
was going to require approximately 30,000 original drawings per episode, and was going to cost Tezuka's production company roughly 6 million yen, with other costs like voice acting and sound design still yet to be factored in. Tezuka, however, only had a budget of 1.5 to 2.5 million yen per episode, which he financed from his own personal manga fortune, loans, and a very small number of investors. So Tezuka still had to find a way to cut costs. So he did it in the area he knew best, the animation. What Tezuka did was instead of having one drawing only hold for one frame, he had that same drawing hold for three frames. So now, instead of needing 24 original drawings for each second of animation, he only needed eight. This is a practice known as animating on threes, and it cut the cost of the production to one third the original cost, putting the show within budget. However, in doing so, Tezuka also reduced the earning potential of animators because the pool of frames available to work on per episode was now one third of what it was originally. And even after all of these cost-cutting measures, Tezuka still had one final hurdle he needed to overcome. He needed to convince the broadcasters to put his show on the air. For Japanese TV networks, airing something like Astro Boy, an animated television series, was risky because there was no guarantee it was going to be profitable since it had never been done before. The networks didn't know if anyone was actually going to watch an animated TV show. So Tezuka had no other choice but to cut a lucrative profit sharing deal to get his show on the air. That deal looked a little something like this. Normally, TV networks would pay the production company a licensing fee in exchange for letting them air their show on their network. The networks would then make money by running ads during the show run. And if the show brought in more viewers, the networks would be able to make more ad revenue. And if the ads generated more revenue than the licensing fee for the show, the TV networks would make a profit. This increase in viewership also benefited the production company because if more people watch the show, then there's a greater chance for someone to buy some show-related merchandise, from which they will be able to collect an even greater amount of royalties off of. And this is how a profit-sharing deal would look normally. But Tezuka had a problem. The TV networks didn't want to air his show. And if no one watched his show, he wouldn't be able to make any money from the merchandising tie-ins. So in order to convince the TV networks, Tezuka waived the licensing fee. So Tezuka was actually taking a loss on the show itself and planned to make up that deficit through the merchandising tie-ins. This deal only worked for Tezuka because of two very specific reasons. The first was that Tezuka had the unique benefit of being the creator of the manga his show was based off of. So whether the show made money or not for the production company, Tezuka was going able to recoup some of the money he invested personally, because the show basically acted as an advertising campaign for his already existing and popular manga. The second reason being, when you take a look at this graph, historically, merchandising tended to create more revenue than advertising on TV. But nowadays, take a look at this crowd during a premiere of a single episode of Dragon Ball Z Super. Just listen to how the crowd chants the name of the main character during a pivotal moment in the episode. Now look at this graph showcasing how, as of 2020, the rising popularity of anime globally, fueled by overseas streaming, has now seen the revenue from the overseas market eclipse the domestic Japanese market. But since animation studios don't share in those overseas streaming profits or any profits outside of those merchandising tie-ins, this cycle of tight budgets and unlivable wages has remained. Tezuka honestly thought that if he could just get his show on the air, he would be able to drum up support from Japanese investors. But the truth was, it didn't work as he intended. After the airing of the fourth episode, Tezuka's production company had enough funds left for one more episode, and it looked as though the studio was nearing bankruptcy. But it didn't, because America's fear of communism in the Pacific stirred great investment into the Japanese economy, which led to NBC Enterprises purchasing the rights for 52 more episodes. And because of this crucial investment, Astro Boy became a domestic and international sensation. However, Tezuka's decision to keep production costs low combined with cost-cutting measures and an unfavorable profit-sharing model, got his show on the air. But it forever trapped the anime industry into a production cycle that requires external investment just to survive. And the individuals who were, and still are, most impacted by this cycle are the animators. Uh, it was 50 years ago, uh, when you draw one frame, you can eat a, on ramen. Yeah. Right. But the rate of the life increase, 
But the yeah. French inflation. Price. Yeah, that's oh, the price. Oh, okay. So now if you want to eat a ramen, you have at least a, to do a five or six frame. Oh my. Oh my. And back when Tezuka was first producing Astro Boy, if you take a look at the characters, the backgrounds, the special effects, the animation in general was relatively simple. However, if we take a look at animation nowadays, it has become so detailed and complex that an animator could spend hours on a single drawing but still only net themselves 200 yen. But solving the issue of low wages is not as simple as just paying animators more money because of the industry precedents Tezuka set. With most studios going into debt, just to survive the inception of the show itself, increasing wages would cause a number of these smaller studios to go bankrupt. This would lead to the consolidation of the industry into a handful of mega studios. And this is something we are already seeing start to happen. When you ask people on the street what their favorite anime is, Chances are you'll hear something like All these shows have something in common. They're shown in anime, a genre typically formulized by their highly detailed action sequences. This graph shows us how Demon Slayer's Infinity Train, a shonen anime, became the first non-Hollywood produced and Japanese animated film to ever top the annual box office. So for investors, they become more incentivized to push studios into producing these action-packed hits, all because it's a formula for success that guarantees them a profit. Just listen to what Joey, the anime man as he is known on YouTube, has to say about how formalized anime has become. It really says a lot about anime when all it takes is for me to read a synopsis. Yeah. And yeah. I could probably tell you with 90% accuracy what the first three episodes of that anime is going to be about. Like yeah. there's just so much like mediocre stuff mm -hmm. that is so un uninspired and, mm -hmm. and just rehashing of what we've seen before yeah. and, and just, yeah. just kind of jumping off <clears throat> successful characters and, and mm -hmm. premises we've had before. That's why it's so important for these smaller studios to continue to exist. Smaller studios are able to explore and develop new art styles and animation techniques like the one seen here in Ping Pong the Animation because they don't have a formula or standard that a more established studio would need to live up to. For example, look at how similar the art style is between these two shows produced by a fairly established animation studio, Studio UFO Table. The existence of these smaller studios also helps prevent the formation of an anime oligopoly, which would only serve to further disadvantage animators. Because if these smaller studios disappeared, the decreased competition would reduce an animator's ability to negotiate their salary and choose the type of shows they themselves would want to work on. Without these smaller studios, the daring creativity that was once a hallmark of Japanese animation would disappear. And without a change in how profit is divided in the industry, this is the future we are slowly heading towards.